People use the term fermentation to cover whatever is going on within that vessel during this vitally important six weeks time. Within which there are essentially two very different fermentations going on one after another. After being poured into the cavalry, the must first sits quietly for a period of three to six days, depending on the inner temperature of the vessel. My Kvevri temperature in autumn is a constant 25 degrees Celsius. And the outdoor temperature now is 32. The Kvevri temperature might decrease slightly in winter, not much, a degree or two, never to drop below 20, which is the bottom line for the wine to stay active. On the other hand, however much heat the fermentation generates, the ground is taking it away through thermal transmission on the Kvevri walls, rendering the contents a consistent environment, such as the beauty and the genius of the Kvevri. At 25 degrees, we don't see any visible activities going on in the must for the first three days, during which time hundreds of types of wild yeast enjoy equal opportunities in multiplying themselves and competing against one another for sugar and nutrition. On the third day afternoon or on the fourth day, we see skins, stems and bubbles floating up to the surface, forming a layer of firm, aka the cap. Nothing gives me keener satisfaction than punching down the cap like this. This punched down instrument I'm holding is made of a camellia tree trunk which is vastly available amongst the mountains around us. This part of China is not famous but for the camellia oil, the olive oil of the Orient, so it is known. On seeing the cap, you realize the battle is reaching a conclusive point. And after some further waiting, you start to smell a faint clue of alcohol coming from the must, which is when your favorite yeast has won the battle. Out of hundreds of species, it is the chosen one, the wine yeast, or more academically, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, which survives and thrives in alcohol to a certain degree. Well, all other competitors perish in 3 to 4% of alcohol in the must. The first few days are the deciding period of time when the wine is to multiply themselves by the geometric series eventually to reach a number big enough to sustain an alcoholic fermentation required of the must. Once the alcoholic fermentation sets off, you as winemaker want to punch down a certain amount of oxygen into the must to keep the yeast alive and propagating. But you don't want to punch down too much so that sufficient oxidation results in complete digestion of sugar by the wine yeast into carbon dioxide, 
rather than alcohol, which is a consequence of incomplete digestion of sugar by the wine yeast due to lack of oxygen. This is a please God make me good but not yet type of dilemma. And the art is to feed the yeast with just enough air up to a point when all sugar is consumed. That marks the end of the alcoholic fermentation. At this point, your pumice smells heavy with alcohol and tastes intolerably sour. To achieve a delicious flavor, it now must go through another process called the malolactic fermentation. The malolactic fermentation is the breaking down of the malic acid, which tastes like the acid in an apple, into lactic acid which is a uh, buttery tasting and a great deal more palatable. It often happens naturally when the alcoholic fermentation ends. Unlike the alcoholic fermentation, the malolactic fermentation works entirely devoid of oxygen. That's airlock becomes key to the success of that procedure. As this process is slow and long, often taking a month or more in a cavalry like one of mine. The contents are at great risk of spoilage once too much air is allowed in by accident or by mistake. To avoid any misfortune, the cavalry is often sealed with beeswax on the rim and an airlock is placed to allow carbon dioxide out, but no air coming in. That's right. 